Hi, everyone. We're live. Good afternoon and welcome to the second episode of Mirror Moments. We are very excited to have you all joining us today. Um, our conversation today is going to be talking about amplifying Asian alliances. Um, this webinar series is focused on sharing how communities of color are navigating the challenges presented by COVID-19 and specifically how creative communities are using their resources, are using their spirit, are using their connections to uh, make a difference among different groups of people of color. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, I'm just gonna, in no particular order, I'm going uh, on the order that they are on my Zoom screen, so forgive me. Uh, I'm gonna start off with, um, with Elliot Lum. So Elliot, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, just your, your name and your title and a little bit about how you um, got to be at the a and Sure, so my name is Elliot Lum and I am the uh, SVP of Talent Strategy over at the a and Educational Foundation. How I came to that role was I, I was in the music business for six years running business development at Columbia Records. I took a year off to write a book about young entrepreneurs and ended up uh, really loving sort of this talent space and uh, have a lifelong sort of passion around marketing. So when they offered me an opportunity to work on talent strategy, it was like, it's, it was the perfect fit. So I've been there for about three years. Well, that's fabulous. And then Serena, we'll have you go next. And I see you have a little furry friend with you. you can introduce yeah. yourself, Serena <laughs> Kim and furry friend. Um, yes, I'm a writer and editor. Um, so uh, I guess in the marketing realm, I write executive speeches for Samsung and I write copy for the Grammys and I curate music for Amazon, other streamers, but <clears throat> my main thing is I'm just a writer, so I could write anything. Like I write poems, I write scripts, I write speeches, I write lots of articles, and I'm also an editor. Um, I was first published in 1996 in Stress Magazine, which is like a really um, old school underground hip hop scene founded by a graffiti king named Alan Kett. And I've been pretty much a hip hop journalist for like 15, 20 years, and then after that, I transitioned to copywriting and marketing. And then from there, I transitioned back to kind of focusing more on Asian American media. And I was the editor in chief of Character Media, which used to be Coriam Journal and Corasian Media. But when I got there, we changed the name and we rolled out a new rebranding and everything. And so okay, well, we, we look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you so much, Serena, welcome. Um, and I will next go to Carmen Kwong. Can you introduce yourself? Carmen, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. First of all, happy APAM um, to all the Asian American community out there. Um, so my name is Carmen Kwong. I actually work at Mirror Digital with the lovely Sheila. And um, I actually was in digital media for the last almost 10 years. Um, the first seven years have, has been in the general market space. Um, and the last two and a half have been at Mirror Digital working with um, the lovely team and really targeted campaigns to the multicultural audience, so, um, which is why I'm here. Fantastic, thank you, Carmen. And then Dan, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Matthews. Um, I am with a company called International Secret Agents and uh, we primarily do a lot of uh, consulting and producing within uh, the Asian American entertainment and creative scene. Um, we are uh, big proponents of a lot of digital content. And so uh, a lot of the big uh, Asian American digital um, shows and, and uh, creators and influencers are people that we've helped support. And then we're currently working on a, uh, we do a, an annual Asian uh, Pacific American Heritage Month uh, event. This year it's gonna be a live stream, but we do a lot of like things within the music realm too. And so we do a lot of different tours and uh, we do an annual festival for Asian Heritage Month, but uh, this year it's gonna be a live stream that we're really happy to be partnering up with Mirror Digital on. And then outside of that, I'm a Korean adoptee. I think a lot about race and uh, identity. And then I also do uh, music too. And so I like to write and uh, perform as well. Awesome, so a wonderful, amazingly diverse group of panelists, and I'm so excited to have some time with all of you. So why don't you tell me a little bit, and then anybody can jump in who feels inspired. How did you get into your industry? What got you excited? What got you started? And Elliot, I know you started to tell us a little bit about that, but I wanna hear a little bit about your story, kind of how you ended up where you are. So who wants to go first? Sure, I'll go. Um, so you call me out, so here we go. So uh, okay. 
<laughs> I'm good at that. You'll find. <laughs> I, I, I've always been attracted to this, to, to marketing. Like when I was at school, I was an art history major. And what I did like for one project was literally go around the city of New York city and, and like take photos of like, of, 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 um, uh, billboards, right. Of like on bus shelters and the outdoor. Cause I felt like it was sort of outdoor art and, and it, there was always like a visual connection to marketing about how what marketing said and then what sort of it was convincing you to do. So my career really was like, okay, let me get the quantitative side. So when I went to business school, I was, I was at MIT and, and got the quantitative side to sort of partner with the qualitative. Went to Colgate Pomala, which is known as a, a really strong marketer uh, from a CPG perspective. And then sort of mm -hmm. was like, listen, like I love the marketing space, wanna try, I feel like, you know, this entertainment space is obviously blowing up between brands and, and artists. So I've moved to Columbia Records. And then now obviously the story about writing a book and kind of like giving back to the next generation of talent uh, about what I've actually learned to kind of pull that next generation up. So that's so sort of- with, my all, with all that diversity in terms of experience that you've had, what do you find most fulfilling about the work you're doing now? That it actually has like meaningful difference, right? Like we built programs at scale. You know, we worked, to, we have like an internship program that scales to 2000 applicants. We, have, we work with professors that sort of engage with, you know, thousands and thousands of students, right? So that's probably the most sort of like fulfilling piece is that what you actually do has a real tangible, uh, scalable impact. I love that. I love that. Who wants to go next? I guess for me, uh, I, can, I can hop in. Uh, my story is relatively short. Um, I started at a nonprofit in San Diego after college. I got really involved with a uh, Asian film festival down there, and that was kind of my kickoff into the community. And uh, through that, I was able to, uh, I, I had a mentor down there that was really amazing at being able to share community as well as um, uh, how to kind of integrate yourselves into and in, in using media as a way to get out messaging. And so through that, I learned a lot about Asian, Asian American film, music. And then uh, uh, right around that time is when uh, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram kind of took off. And so uh, some of the partners that I've got right now, we got really lucky that we were able to uh, adapt to that um, generation and then be able to use that as a way of getting out uh, really cool content. And then uh, I'm very uh, just grateful to be able to say that we've been able to just kind of grow up in that scene and continue to do concerts and events and uh, create content that we think is hopefully helping to support uh, young Asian American audiences. And, um, and so it's been really interesting just to see how everything's been growing, but went from a nonprofit and then I moved to LA about 10 years ago to work and do what we're doing right now. I love it. I love it. Um, I love that what you said about using, um, messaging, uh, in media and how you're connecting those and tying it back to, um, the community. So thank you for sharing that. Um, who wants to go next? Well, I, I touched on it a little bit before. Um, sorry, Zerna. Uh, so I touched on um, that I was in digital media for about 10 years. And for the first seven, it has been general market. And so I did learn a lot about digital media. And then going to Mirror Digital and having to continuously learn about the nuances and subtleties of culture um, and then the um, diversity within each you know, ethnicity. Um, <laughs> that has continually fueled um, you know, a daily learning, getting connected with people like Dan through going to conferences specific to you know, black communities, Latinx communities and Asian communities, um, gives you a drive that is different than um, the general market space. So it's always, it's been really exciting. And um, again, uh, we're working with, um, on a really great project with Dan. So things like that um, really make this worthwhile. Fantastic. And Serena, what about you? Well, throughout the 90s, I was a hip hop journalist and a, and a DJ. Um, and then in the 2000s, I became um, the features editor at Vibe Magazine. And I freelanced like a lot of music journalism all throughout. And then what happened was around 2007, like the blogs took over and the internet broke journalism. So I had to regroup and I had had a baby. So I decided to try to um, work in marketing and do copywriting because I figured that was a steadier paycheck than journalism. 
-hmm. So then I worked at Apple Music for a really long time writing copy and social media copy specifically until I was recruited by Samsung, as I said. And then I was just kind of like loafing around and then James Rue at um, Core Asian Media at that time contacted me about writing the scripts for Unforgettable Awards. So uh -huh. years. Yeah, we love James. He's awesome. Okay. I wrote the Unforgettable scripts and then from there I became the managing editor and then from there I became the editor-in-chief and uh, it's kind of it. And now <laughs> <laughs> but what happened at Character Media was that I realized how many Asian Americans were doing cool things in entertainment and how we don't have to just be behind the scenes. Like, we could be writing stories. And, and I met so many creatives, like directors, actors, writers, musicians. And I was like, why don't I do something too? You know, I don't have to just always report on it. I could also tell my story. So I've been focused on um, writing a screenplay based on my DJ experience from the 90s. Oh, wow. That is going to be, I'm sure, amazing. Um, so it's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. We're at the tail end of it. So I'd love to hear um, what does APAM mean to all of you? Uh, and specifically, what, one thing, being in the multicultural space for so long, um, you know, when I think about Asian American culture, I always remind myself that it's cultures because Asians come from almost 50 countries and they come here and then we put them all together in one group. So I want to hear like about that tension, like how do we celebrate Asian Americans collectively, but still honor and cherish and remember the individual cultures that comprise this group um, altogether. So anyone who wants to dive in there and tell me a little bit about what they think about APAM. Um, okay, I'll go. Um, I think it's super important that Asian Americans realize that we're not just like separated in ethnic enclaves like Vietnamese, Hmong, Pakistani, because our, our parents' generation kind of come here with that, like, well, you're Korean, you're not Chinese, and then you, we take that, and then we're like, oh, I just hang out with Korean people. What we need to do is like unify as Asian Americans across ethnic lines, because um, it's the only way that we can have like a political voice in this country and not be and not be perceived as foreigners all the time. And so I think that we're on the midst, which is super exciting for me because I didn't have it, of developing a true like trans, pan Asian Pacific culture with like shared cultural references, like, you know, boba pride or like, you know, the ramen spots, like things that we are proud of that like transcend our ethnic backgrounds, but more define our Asian American backgrounds. Okay, other perspectives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with Serena. We do, I mean, we comprise of over or just about 50 different cultures, languages. And I think in the U.S., we're lucky that we're unified with, you know, the English language. Um, and before this, it was a lot of like segmentation um, between the different ethnicities. But now I do feel a, an uprising of the different communities coming together and realizing that with our collective voice, it's so much more powerful than just, you know, I'm Chinese American or I'm Korean American. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Like, I think for me, it, you know, and Sheila, you and I had this conversation. For me, it's like, I think about it pre-COVID, post-COVID. So pre-COVID, for me, it was like just about, it was a, it was a month to celebrate and, and acknowledge and recognize and, and great to sort of like do that. Like when I was at Colgate, I was the, the lead on the ERG, you know, Asian group, right? And so you did all the activities, you celebrated, you got people together. And I thought that was, you know, a really nice thing to do. I'd say like post COVID in a xenophobic environment where there's a lot of like really sort of heavy things that are actually going on. When you look at eight incidents, which is about 1700 over the past month and you see it sort of in the news and you actually then kind of like it happens during the month that people are trying to celebrate and and it is so important to hear sort of everybody's voices like emotionally so i think the way that i see it for me intellectually it made sense now emotionally it sort of like makes a lot more sense right now about how it's so important for this collective voice to to mm -hmm. to happen within the community but why it's so important for what you know you do which is this amplifying asian voices about connecting to other communities as well and so that is, it, to me, like that's what this moment in time, it's a very sort of important historical moment in time right now. Yes, I agree. I, the sense of, it was like, it, it's the sense of urgency is just so strong um, and it's all come together 
uh, in a crescendo almost. Dan, do you want to add to that as well? I think what everybody said uh, is generally how I, I feel about it too. But if I were going to add anything, it would just be that from what I'm seeing uh, just socially and from around my own communities, it's become more of a, a common thing and it's more socially acceptable for just even Asians to be able to say that this is a month that they take ownership over. And so it's been really cool to be able to, um, that maybe like two years ago, the Asians didn't even know it was Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And last year, maybe like another 25% like new this year, it seems like there's different events, different things popping up left and right that uh, people are a lot more proud of like just posting it on uh, social media and talking about it out loud versus a couple of years ago, people probably weren't that proud to be able to talk about it and share it. So it's, it's really cool. I think that it just makes everybody a lot more cohesively uh, on uh, the same wavelength. And through that, I think that a lot of education and information gets out once everybody's on that same wave, wavelength. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the, the title of this, of this conversation is Amplifying Asian Alliances. So who do we think is doing, doing that well? Um, you know, Dan, you're talking about, you've seen a lot more activity. What do you think is working? What do you think is having an impact? Um, at a very like surface level, I do think that uh, even though to a certain extent, it's, it's a little bit, um, maybe it's not that deep, but like, I do think that the social media posts are helping. I think people just posting up photos and celebrating their family or celebrating moments, I think is extremely helpful. Um, and from that, again, there's people that I, there's this really great PBS series that's on right now about the history of Asian Americans. And I've heard so many Asian Americans that like usually don't care about stuff like that, start talking about it just within our own groups. Uh, and again, that wouldn't have happened like two or three years ago. So I think that um, there's a lot of really, again, things that you would, you would think would be making a difference that are finally making a difference now that maybe my Asian American friends, the general Asian American public, maybe wouldn't necessarily be uh, watching or tuning into. So I, th I think that's kind of, uh, I think that's kind of cool. Awesome. I did want to chime in. I think we're starting to come into our own, like I, I overheard, or I think I saw Fat Joe, you know, the rapper Fat Joe, talking about how um, like it's the Asian Americans turn right now to get it, like to get the real like xenophobia and the race, racial attacks. But then the other side to that is I think we will eventually come out of it with more acceptance as not being foreigners. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If there's more like not more attacks, but more uh, media attention and publicity on the, the wrongness of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you build alliances. Do, um, any, um, anything else, that, Elliot or Carmen, do you want to add anything on that point? Sure. I, so uh, in terms of alliances, I mean, you sort of asked like what's working, right? And so like within the ANA infrastructure, that's the Association of National Advertisers where I am. You know, we have groups like hashtag see her, which fights for gender equity or hashtag see all the Alliance for Inclusive and Multicultural Marketing, which is all about equal representation in media. Um, there's other things in the in the marketing and advertising industry that have done an incredible job to, to, to drive equality and equity in not just sort of representation, but you know how I think there's a program called free the bid, but you can also look at things like gold house, for instance, right, which is uh, an initiative to, to really bring together Asian American influencers and, and really celebrate that culture both from a public standpoint and then a private standpoint. You know, Sheila, I've talked to like Anastasia Williams about the, the A100 list or the A list, right, where they were, you know, building sort of the exclusive community. So there's definitely things that are out there. I think, you know, this conversation is incredibly relevant about how do you actually integrate all of that together where a lot of these sort of voices, everybody sort of has their own unique voice, which is crucial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you build the allyship to ensure that those voices can be heard on a more collective basis? Right, and get folks talking. Carmen, yeah, you're gonna I, I definitely agree with Elliot, the allyship, um, not only within the Asian American communities, but I've been seeing a lot of, you know, black folks and Latinx folks also bringing attention to the plight and the xenophobia that is going on uh, during COVID and, the, and vice versa. So we're seeing a huge shift in uh, maybe the people of color communities really coming together and lifting everyone up collectively. Oh, you know what campaign really killed it with the APAP messaging is Hulu. 
Did y'all see that? Really? No. Oh, it was so, I felt so proud. It was like, oh my God, what's happening? Oh, we, we have to we have to check it out. I yeah. definitely have to check it out after this. And um, put some examiners. This is um, the perfect segue because my next question was, how can brands connect authentically? You know, we are in the media, marketing, influencer, branding, community activist space, all of those combined. How do we think about having our brand partners, whether they're corporate brand partners or community brand partners or other partners, um, connect with Asian American audiences in a way that really makes sense? I think, first of all, you have to um, make sure that whoever is creating these programs or these brand messages um, come from or are vetted by people who are in that community. Um, if you kind of Amen. In, <laughs> imagine yourself in that place, but you aren't, you know, an actual person mm -hmm. of that community, um, the messages might get lost. And um, just acknowledging where your shortcomings are and having to bring in experts or people who, who have lived that experience is very important. Other thoughts? I yeah, just, oh, go ahead. I'll add, like, I think there's like, you know, to, to Sheila, like there's, there's the data component, right? So Nielsen has like a, an annual report on sort of the state of Asian American, uh, the market, right? Sort of all the, the trends in the- Yeah, it just, it just dropped a couple days ago. Just dropped and Mariko has been doing that for the past uh, couple of years. And obviously data sings, right? In terms of like, where you're actually investing your dollars. So get sort of grounded in the data piece. I think an easy place to start often is because because the because the you know the market is fragmented right and and there are a couple of like specialized agencies that focus on the Asian American community. You have IW Group, you have Intertrend, you have TDW and Co. And so they've sort of captured sort of a lot of these different marketers who uh, actually want to market to this community. I think the key for those that sort of are are don't necessarily have like that hyper focus, like a good way to get into it candidly is just like you know working with a nonprofit. You know, there's a group called Ascend, for instance, that uh, is a great sort of business platform that, that, that's an easy connection, but it, it allows like you to get a dip, like to, to dip your toe in the water, so to speak, and kind of get to understand it to, to what Carmen said. Got it. Got it. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah. I just wanted to say that um, there's a Jimmy O. Yang comedy special on Amazon right now that's like freaking hysterical. <laughs> And there's okay. one thing he talks about how in the beer commercial that they showed the Super Bowl, they never put Asian men in the ads. So if they became more sensitive about representation, <laughs> like Asian masculinity in terms of advertising and associating it with, you know, that type of stuff, then I think that would be a great movement. Okay, that's great. So um, lots of brands are doing lots of things, but you guys are all doing lots of cool things. So can you all tell me uh, what your current projects are uh, around APAM? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in and just, uh, <laughs> um, we've got something coming up this weekend that we're working on with, uh, with you guys. And then also to really briefly touch on the last topic, one of the things that I've really liked seeing this APAM has been all of the different brands like L'Oreal or Gap or um, again, again, there's the only two that come, but there have been a lot more organizations and companies that have been doing panels like this, um, mainly just internally. It hasn't been a public facing thing, but even if you're doing it just for your internal population, I think that still makes an impact. And so I think it's been really cool seeing a lot of these companies do APAM related webinars or APAM related things just for their own employees or employer resource groups. So that's, that's kind of neat. And they are doing a lot more public facing things too. Um, again, uh, the Hulu campaign, I do know what you're talking about, uh, Serena, and it is very cool. It's cool to see a big company like that have Asian faces out there that they're putting out more prominently. It's cool seeing Near Digital do a panel on a amplifying Asian voices. I think that's extremely important. So I think companies are taking, they, they are, taking an important look at that and are doing stuff. So um, this is programming that I'm a big fan of for APAM. 
uh, we've got a, we're, we're currently in the middle of a project right now with, uh, with y'all and uh, McDonald's that uh, you guys helped us put together. We were able to partner up with some podcasts to be able to talk about heroes in the Asian American community. And it was really cool being able to uh, find these heroes and being able to have the podcast, but then also having uh, McDonald's come on to be able to support that. And then uh, we're tying it all together. We're um, doing a big APAM um, uh, concert this weekend called Identity, uh, where we've got a lot of different international and Asian American acts. Um, a lot of big actors, Sung Kong, Kelly Hu, uh, Andrew Yang, um, they're all uh, going to be hosting this weekend too. So it's going to be cool having them all on uh, as hosts and doing these live performances. And then throughout that, we're going to be showing off these different Asian American hero stories throughout it. So uh, that was kind of a cool program that um, I was put together uh, pretty quick, but it's amazing to see the support for it and being able to see it finally launch out there. So uh, that's something that's currently going on. Um, Dan, and can just, you oh, oh, go ahead, Carmen. Oh, no, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Um, just to touch on what um, Dan said, uh, on the podcast, we were working with um, really prominent Asian uh, figures in the, the space. We have Mei Li, we're working with Next Shark, Asian Boss Girl, and these are very um, popular podcasts right now that are making a huge difference. So working with them, working with Dan, um, to highlight these community heroes within the Asian um, American space. Um, has really been amazing. They both um, created special uh, APAM episodes. So definitely go check it out, Asian Boss Girl and on uh, May Lee's show. Just a little plug there. Yeah, full disclosure, we're all working on this. But one thing I did want to uh, just have Dan touch on was, and he's working on it right now because his live stream's on Saturday. So that's why he's not looking at me. Dan. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit how Identity came together and, you know, kind of what the history of that and the whole Project Blue Marble? Because I actually don't know much about the history. It started off as a program in the city of Los Angeles. And so the city of L.A. Um, had just gotten their first uh, Asian American, the first Korean American council member, second Asian American council member in the history of the, uh, the city, David Rue. And David Rue wanted to do a uh, activity for Asian Heritage Month. So I think that alone already shows you that having representation um, in positions of power to be able to do things that represent your community, uh, why, it, why it matters. So he wanted to do an event. Uh, we were able to uh, take that event. It started off as a, a street fair. It turned into a festival in front of City Hall. And then uh, over the last two years, it's morphed into uh, more of a nonprofit international movement. Uh, and so we were able to take it and um, uh, position it more in uh, something that um, could not just be LA based. It could, we could do it in different cities too. And then uh, this last year, due to everything that's going on in the community, uh, we were able to take and turn it into a uh, live stream of that. And so it's kind of morphed over the last couple of years. Uh, but we've been doing it for about five years now. And it's been really incredible to see the growth of, uh, of how it's been. But most importantly, also, that there's a need for it. People really want to, they're mm -hmm. super, uh, there's crowds that are really interested in coming out. And that you see that having um, accessible artists and messages of uh, jazzed up about so it was cool being able to see it and then bring it back to the uh, the allies component it's not just asian americans that are there celebrating it's people from all different communities that are just artists and then if we can bring that ace where they can see music they can relate to but then also hear messages about like why the asian american community matters why uh the things that are going on in our community matter uh, i think that it's extremely helpful so you, you hit them in an accessible way mm -hmm. fantastic Elliot, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've been doing with connecting people um, really around this issue of xenophobia? I think it's so powerful. Yeah, so I mean, like Sheila, you and I talked and I think that it was such an emotional moment for me when a lot of that was was happening when I was reading, you know, some of the material like from New York Times. I was like, man, this is just like wrong, right? Like it's like, just like wrong. And it sort of emotionally just hit me in a, in a way that I, I, I felt compelled to do something. And so, you know, my philosophy in kind of organizing a lot of this activity has been much more, there's enough going on out there that's amazing. How do we sort of like create connections between different groups or basically use the skill set of marketers and advertisers to sharpen issues that are actually happening? So probably look at it three different levels. One is like one of the first calls I made was to the Ag Council and 
the Ag Council is like currently thinking about and working on a campaign around xenophobia, um, which is really exciting because there's been a lot of great campaigns out there. Wash the hate. I am not a virus. Racism is not a is a is a virus, and like awesome activity. Why didn't Kennedy just came out with something? So there's a lot of activity. And often that activity sort of like is in one particular lane, which is sort of the, the Asian American lane. I think like with the Ag Council's kind of work, there's opportunity to, to expand that to sort of a mainstream audience. And so really excited, like my role is I'm not, I don't work at the Ag Council, but how do I sort of like make sure that what they're, what they're actually doing is shaped and they're connecting to the right people, um, bringing people to the, the resources to them that can actually help sharpen their message. So, you know, from an awareness building standpoint, like really believe that this really hopefully has the opportunity to break through. On the second level, I'd say just what's the mobilization actually look like from just an internal advertising and marketing standpoint? Like, okay, like let's talk to like all the Asian American CMOs, right? Like didn't know that there were like 15 to 20 of them, but we all brought them together for them to actually see each other and say, wow, there's a real sense of belonging there. Like same thing on the advertising side, who are the agencies? Same thing on sort of the mm -hmm. chief diversity side on the chief. So it's like, how do you create sort of the, 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 the connections and the discussion points? And then now like, how do you actually mobilize for action? Which is sort of the third piece of like, okay, what are the actual issues that matter? And so I've divided into like five things, right? Like there's an awareness building piece, there's community integration. How do you integrate folks from journalism, from entertainment, from music all together run under this umbrella. There's allyship, which is sort of like this lane. The fourth is like reporting, which is like crucial, like data it sort of tells a lot of stories to kind of drive the narrative. And then the fifth is economic enfranchisement, right? So a lot of small businesses are being crushed right now. Mm -hmm. um, and businesses are at a higher, a disproportionate rate. So you have like big areas. And then the question is, how do you actually sort of mobilize that the, the, the industry that we have to actually take action and help, you know, groups like Stop AAPI Hate or help, you know, uh, the, like PBS, for instance, like I've been talking to them about their all Amer their Asian American sort of documentary. And what do you like, they have a learning resource, for instance, that, um, ultimately uh, elementary schools can, and teachers can actually sort of access and bring that curriculum into their own curriculum, right? To start to make sure that Asian American history is actually taught at school. So there's a, I think you, you kind of go from like the high level to really the tactical, and then you mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. people to actually lean in to, to, to actually make an impact, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like kind of the way that I've been like spending my, a lot of my time to, to, to figure out what are the core issues and then get people to act on it. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. The mobilization piece, I think really resonate because you can talk and talk and talk and have these very high level, beautiful ideas. But when you can't execute, um, that becomes, you know, where the idea just kind of just falls flat and, you know, it's swept under the rug. So um, I think talking about it is great, but then also finding the pieces, um, connecting with people, seeing if one person can provide you know, um, different elements where um, once put together, it really creates a more impactful, like a uh, powerful program. You can't do it alone. So you definitely need help from all different uh, spaces in the community. Yeah. And Elliot, just building on what Carmen is saying, can you talk a little bit about your approach, how you um, kind of went out on a really grassroots level and spoke to lots of people? I, literally, Elliot and I got connected through a, a mutual friend, um, you know, Lupe de los Santos, and just having such a meaningful conversation about what was happening was a very impactful way to meet. And you've had so many of those conversations. Can you just talk about who you've been connecting with? And yeah, so it's, it's been, you know, honestly, anybody who wants to talk about things who basically sort of <laughs> has like, a, has a, an approach of like, hey, you know, we have an audience, we'd love to, we have, a group of people who want to lean in, right? So it could be, you know, someone like yourself, Sheila was the chief diversity officer at Temple University, who I interviewed in my diversity disconnect study, or, you know, uh, the chief diversity officer at, at Wendy's. Like, it, it, I mean, I'm sorry, at, uh, at McDonald's, whose name is Wendy Lewis, right? So it, it was a very sort of intentional, you know, kind of like haphazard process of like, who's going to talk to me? And have these meaningful conversations about like, wow, like this is wrong. Like, but you know what? Like, it's useful to hear that 
this has been happening in other communities as well been, and acknowledging that and saying, listen, it's not a marketing problem that we're trying to solve, right? It is a societal sort of issue that mm -hmm. we're trying to sort of figure out how to like, you know, have a sustainable foundation and infrastructure to actually kind of move it forward together. And um, so, you know, I put together like an email like every two weeks right now where it's like, okay, here are all the people I've talked to, the connectors. And then saying like, listen, like back to the, then that's why I sort of started out with the approach of, listen, like I'm not about to start a new organization, right? Like I'm not raising funds for, it's like, I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> to make sure that like, hey, as Chong is connected with Lucia Liu about like, you know, she's in advertising, she, the other uh, is in sort of um, entrepreneurship, like what kinds of things can you put together that's gonna benefit both of your audiences? Cause I think it's better together, right? So that's sort of the entire uh, philosophy about it. And um, I think it's like, you know, it's, it feels just the right approach. Uh, cause I get to meet a lot of great people and, and connect with them, but I want them to actually do the work. So my approach is very much B2B. <laughs> <laughs> More people in the boat. <laughs> yes. More people in the you boat. You watch those the magical boat. connections happen and you never know where they're going to go. Right. Serena, do you want to talk a little bit about how you've been thinking about having an impact as APAM and specifically in the light of COVID and things that have been happening? Um, every month is APAM for me. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> when you're doing character yes, it was like funny because when APAM came around, it was like, what are we going to do that's different? We always cover APAM. So that's kind of like the inside ethnic media situation. But we actually did do a whole bunch of things. Um, but this time I'm not working there. So. Don't really know what else to say. Mm -hmm. I always well, joke that Dan is my connection to the Asian American community because Dan knows everybody. So having um, really great resources like Dan to like um, direct you and guide you, um, I think is very important. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's go back to brands and advertisers since that's so much of what we do. I'd love to hear thoughts about how they should adjust messaging to authentically speak to the Asian community. A couple of you guys have referenced Hulu. Like, what did they get right? What are some other brands who are getting it right that can serve as people who are sort of demonstrating those best practices that we can all learn from? Do you guys want to talk a little bit about Hulu? Like, what made it so exciting and interesting? Well, because when Hulu's got like a new like premiere coming on, these, the signage is really big and like bold and exciting. It's like, oh, you know, Handmaid's Tale's coming on. So, it's, so they use that same treatment, but with Asian Americans. So they made it feel very um, normalized and Americanized. And it wasn't like, you know, like water lilies and yin and yang stuff. I mean, that stuff's okay with me. I mean, I love Eastern symbolism, but sometimes it's always like cloaked in this kind of oriental symbolism. Instead, it was just kind of like the hype shit, you know, the, I mean, excuse my language, the hype stuff, the stuff that people want to see, you know? So that's what made me proud to see it and excited. Okay. And what, and what were they, uh, what were they promoting? They just had a bunch of different, like, you know, like moments of movies and shows that they've got coming out that have, uh -huh. um, like they had Constance Wu for a moment, they had, you know, Aquafina for a moment, they had Jason Momoa and just on it, and Keanu Reeves and just a lot of people that we're proud of. And from the entertainment perspective, it's just really exciting. Fantastic. Um, anybody else wanna shout out some brands if they think they're doing a good job? I mean, I would just say, I, it's interesting cause like I, I kind of like, like the work obviously that all those Asian American agencies do, whether it be with, with Walmart, right? Or McDonald's or with Toyota or um, uh, Alaska Airlines, AT&T, all of the market to the Asian American community. Candidly, I actually have not seen any of that work. But what I will say is that <laughs> there's a commitment to it. But I also think too, like, you know, when you think about like, there's such a, there's such a moment right now in like the entertainment space with a lot of like, Asian American films coming out where there's a there's a, a real push both from a representation standpoint and then also from a writer standpoint to be able to kind of like seed a lot of that to actually get it to market. And so like mm -hmm. as we're talking, as we're thinking about this, it's like, how do you do the exact same thing, you know, on the advertising side, 
right, where you actually see sort of, you know, these Hulu kind of um, marketing messages that are, are out there that are much more sort of mainstream. And probably my hypothesis is like, hey, the data is not there, right? People aren't using the data. Probably the representation isn't there as well. And the dollars aren't there. So that kind of is like something that as an advertising and Asian American advertising kind of community, we can kind of like look at and just say that, you know, can we make sure that we get that fair share of representation so that so that those stories can be told in a, in a, in a marketing and advertising format. Yeah, that's so important. You know, at Mirror Digital, we um, serve black, brown, and Asian communities. So we're helping um, advertisers reach African-American, Latinx, Asian communities. And a lot of times we are advocating to include um, budgets against Asian audiences. And we're telling that story and we're trying to make sure advertisers understand what they're missing by not speaking directly to that consumer. And it really is, in, in, I think, in its nascent um, phases, but I think we're gonna see a lot more, like even with this project um, with McDonald's and they're celebrating community heroes that have done extraordinary things during the COVID crisis, mm -hmm. um, for them to put their energy and their um, resources behind that and supporting charitable organizations mm -hmm. along with that, just speaks to how the tide is is turning. Um, I mean, and, and some people have been doing it for many years and doing it well. Um, but I, I hope like, like as you say, um, Serena, Elliot, everyone knows, everyone's saying, looking forward to seeing more brands getting there. Mm -hmm. um, are there any more um, examples that we, anybody can think of that might be interesting to share with the audience that are, that are hitting the mark or doing it right? I wanted to talk about I would that he's not doing it right or just about the whole problem. Well, That's let's not. talk about the good stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I mean, if, there, if, there's a, if there's a lesson that we want to not call out a brand by name, but if there's a oh, lesson. No, no, no. That I don't want to call out a brand by name. But I would I certainly, I, I would welcome that, but. Um. I just wanted to say that like, so character media, what we were trying to do was speak to an, an English speaking Asian, a pan Asian audience. But every time we try to go to advertisers, they'd always want to do either they were geared towards in language agencies or the um, English language ones weren't really understanding our space. So it was this really tough thing because, so that's why ultimately we didn't have funding and now I'm not working there because we couldn't get the advertisers to get what this space is. That's my only point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, anyone in multicultural marketing or multicultural advertising, <laughs> or I think multicultural anything knows that the struggle is real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the struggle is we're, real. <laughs> we're always is. trying to get fight to get those dollars. Um, well, one other partner that I will say that has done a really good job speaking to the Asian um, American market is Macy's. Macy's has been a longstanding client of Mirror Digital, and they have um, had culturally specific uh, events for Asian American, uh, APAM, for a long, long time. And actually, Dan and I realized that we worked on one together mm -hmm. several years ago with uh, the Far East movement, and we didn't know each other at the time. And then it's funny how things come full circle that we've met now, what, five or six years later on, on another APAM project. Mm -hmm. um, any, other, any other brand uh, suggestions before we move on? Uh, just to jump the final thing, thing uh, that I would quick. Um, go ahead, Dan. Go ahead, Dan. Dan. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say that, like, uh, I think the brands that do it right understand that, like, even within the Asian American community, if you want to target Filipino you got to speak in a very slightly attracted to uh, uh, having East Asian or Korean American. Or, and so I, I do think that it, it is a lot more difficult in advertising to Asian American English or in language. Uh, but the ones that do it right are able to find um, uh, really, really, I don't want to use the word fragmented, but they're able to like find very intricate ways of being able to target different audiences within the, the community. So maybe it's not one size fits all, but that doesn't mean that you don't, even if it's a little bit more difficult, you'll get more um, uh, uh, quality for the buck if you're able to 
uh, advertise to different communities uh, within the same budget. I think that's, so the brands that have done it right have been able to adjust their budgets. Maybe it's, it's a little bit smaller per community, but they're still doing it per community and it becomes a lot more effective. Mm -hmm. um, and just to jump in here, um, brands who are doing it right at this moment because of what uh, the climate and what we're dealing with um, as a community um, who are not really pushing the consumerist uh, angle right now and really focusing and drawing attention and awareness to the plight of the Asian American community. Um, those are the brands that are going to stick into um, our head, our hearts, and then at that point build a real affinity like, okay, this brand, um, whether it's their bottom line that is driving, but it, it's giving the impression that they care. And I think that's hugely important and very necessary right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, quoting one of our dear friends, um, Marissa Nance from Native Tongue Communications, she said brands have had to shift from sales to service. And I feel like that is so on the money exactly. when you think about how you make a connection in this really challenging time when people have so much on their minds. Um, so moving along away from brands, I just want to talk, um, you know, what's next? This conversation uh, we started this webinar series, the impetus was COVID-19, but the conversation doesn't stop when COVID stops. What, uh, what can we do to keep the momentum going, but keeping the alliances going, keeping the conversations going, keep amplifying voices? What are some ideas? I think what Serena said uh, a while back, um, having APAM not just be one month, but in, you know, throughout the year, how can we have brands really pay attention to Asian Americans um, throughout the year for different um, seasons, programs, campaigns, um, that will be a standout for a lot of brands. So APAM is every day. APAM is every month. I would love to see more uh, <laughs> partnerships, not just across Asian American communities like Filipinos and Koreans and Pakistanis and Indians, but across all people of color and build bridges with African American communities politically, economically, and commercially, as well as Latino communities, Latinx communities, because I think that Asian Americans tend to not see themselves as people of color or like white adjacent. And that just brings me like a lot of like shame <laughs> and anger. Like I think that we need to <laughs> ally ourselves with people of color. Absolutely. Other, other ideas? I mean, for me, it's just a lot of um, it's issue engagement and action around that issue. And and that creates a stream of sort of activity about like, what's the issue? OK, like, how do you solve that issue? OK, what, what resources do you need? OK, you know, how do you measure sort of the action? What, what, what happened? And it's just and as I say, it's like this is not just a marketing campaign, right? It's something that's a, it's like you got to put constant pressure. I mean, the idea of like APAC every day is very sort of like real. And it's just, how do you kind of like sustain that through not just sort of like your own personal belief system, but the fact that you are working on a, on a real issue that ultimately has material impact on people's lives that then, you know, you keep on working at it, you keep on working at it, you keep on working at it. And it's, and it's, it is nonstop. And, um, and hopefully again, you can, it, the, the reason why you work on it is because you believe in it. And the reason why you believe in it is because it, it has that material impact. So that's sort of what motivates me to keep on, on, on pushing because it's, you know, I, I think when I talked to Wendy Lewis at, at, at McDonald's and, you know, as I would say, like this for me is all relatively new, right? Intellectually, I got it, but emotionally, I didn't. <laughs> so uh, she's like, wow, that's like, you know, just, you know, that's like a lifetime of work right there. And, and I was like, I don't really know what I don't know. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to just go, go about it and like chip away based on sort of like my own sense of, you know, how I sort of approach things as a marker. So. That makes a lot of sense. Well, how can, you know, in thinking about keeping the momentum going, who do we need to get to help us? How can other communities help? Um, how can Mirror Digital help? Like, what do we think is, there's no silver bullet, but what do we think can move the needle on some of these issues? Like, what would be an example of the kind of helpful thing, just so I know what we're thinking of? Well, I mean, and you, you can think about it. You, you, you started talking about it actually a little bit already, uh, Serena, when you talked about um, thinking about uh, alliances among people of color. So like, what does allyship look like? 
How do you start to build those bridges? Um, how do you get other communities to uh, feel empathetic towards what is happening right now in the Asian American community? How do we communicate those things in ways that other people understand them and, and, and feel aligned? So that's are some of the things that come to mind. From a marketing perspective or from like a political social Just perspective? Many perspectives. So I think it's all connected. You know, when you think about the time and the place that we're in right now, yes, we're marketers. Um, yes, we're media people. Yes, we're storytellers. But we're living in this really unique moment where uh, the human connection is critical. So that can extend across any lane. So you choose. Well, like when I watched the PBS documentary that Dan Matthews was talking about, um, I was amazed to learn that like Asian Americans were probably at the at three of the most like critical moments for people of color in this country in terms of defining yourself as American, but as a non-white person. So the, there was like this tape lawsuit where um, this predated like Brown versus Board of Education. It was about an, a little Chinese American girl who wanted to go to school but she wasn't allowed to go because she wasn't white. So they took it to the Supreme Court and they lost. So that kind of set the tone for the next 200 years of racism. And then the whole like grape protest with Cesar Chavez at the forefront, the ones who actually started the protest were like the Manong Filipinos. And then they brought Cesar Chavez in to be a spokesperson because he was so much more like likable from a media standpoint. And all along the way, Asian Americans have been at pivotal moments that helped Blacks and Latinos across the board, and us, and and we need to focus on those moments of overlap, and not focus on what's different about us or how we're all fighting for the same piece of the pie. I love that. Yeah, I have two tactical ideas, Sheila. Just specific to the data piece about you know where's the budget, the kind of like what you were saying of it's like what's what what do we need to do to sort of help tell that story so that more dollars are unlocked, right? So like. That's one like very sort of like tactical thing that it's like, okay, like how do you think through that? I think that the second thing that you know your 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 group or your collective can do, it's like what are problems that each of are the groups are facing? And you get one of the groups like us, like you know, Asian Americans, like thinking about a problem that a different community has and bring a different lens to create that sense of empathy, right? And be like, oh, like that's that's a tough problem. Let's go like figure that out. And like same thing with and you start to create allyship through investment if you are committed to, to figuring out how that problem works. So I think that would be a really interesting kind of exercise and your group could, could kind of bring together people to actually do that. Like I would love to participate in that because I feel like it would be a, if it's like, I, I don't know anything, it's a chance for me to get to know a little bit more and, and figure out what, how to help somebody else, right? I love that. Any other thoughts? I think really jumping in and showing up for uh, communities of color um, and showing you know, that you care and that you're outreaching to see where you can help. You might not um, be able to do something physically yourself, but amplifying that uh, a story or a post or something um, to get the message out there um, really creates this interconnected relationship with different communities. Um, like I said, to support each other, to be there for each other, to stand up for each other um, is it, just uh, what we need to do moving forward. Fabulous. Well, I'm going to open it up to questions, but before I do that, I want to know, are there any last thoughts or lessons we want to leave our viewers with? I think speaking up, speaking up. Uh, speaking your mind, asking questions, I think is hugely important. Um, don't have an ego about knowing everything um, because there are a lot of resources, a lot of very knowledgeable people um, out there. Um, so keeping that open mind. Fantastic. So audience, thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to have you for this conversation. Do we have any questions um, that anyone would like to address? Okay, so we have an anonymous question here. Um, just asking about how, um, 
how allies can participate in Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in a way that um, is authentic or if you're not Asian. How do we want to address that? I would ask the person who's not Asian to go one whole month every day and every time they see an Asian person just try to think that they probably speak English and that they're probably an American citizen. <laughs> try it and see how they <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, we have, we have another question. Um, if a marketer wants to engage the Asian market for the first time, how do I get started? Who should I reach out to? Mary Digital. I know, you yeah. can reach out to us. <laughs> <laughs> like it's kind of a candid, uh, soft pitch. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> we can help you get started. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, going back to uh, something that Elliot talked about, the data, and something Samia talked about, the, the, um, the, the voice and kind of having the, the language and, and really representing the community. You gotta have some ability to navigate those two things to get started, and you cannot do that on your own as you're just uh, starting to learn the ropes. So Carmen mentioned this as well uh, during her comments. You've got to bring in some experts for sure. Mm -hmm. um, another question: Do you feel that Madison Avenue is representative enough with Asian Americans in key positions? to get campaigns targeted and strategically aligned to get results? So I'll, I'll kind of take a crack at that because I, I, it's, it's, so I, I would have to look at the numbers again in terms of sort of what representation is looking at from an agency standpoint and a marketer standpoint. I do know that, that in general, like, we have been working a lot, both with the ANA and the 4As around sort of diversity and inclusion efforts, right? 4As definitely has invested a lot in it. ANA certainly done the same. And now, Absolutely. you know, I think the 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 it, the study that I have, like I have an inclusion study coming out, and I think in terms of representation. Uh, we, I need to look back at those numbers, but in terms of inclusion, so we created this study called like My Voice Matters, right? And it's all about connecting your voice to a business outcome in a room, in the company, and in the industry. And just sort of like a brief look at the data, you can see like Asians under index when it comes to actually, you know, am I invited to the room when, when, uh, uh, when an important business decision is uh, meeting is made, or am I listened to when my point of view is shared? Um, do I feel like I contributed? So like really things that ultimately, you know, looking at diversity and inclusion through the lens of business outcomes, specifically around like, hey, am I speaking up during these, these discussions and are, are my points of view heard and acted on, even if it's not acted on, or at least they're heard and considered. And so the number is definitely just, again, it's a small sample size, about 250 or so, but um, it was, hey, we under index. And I guess that's not really so surprising, but that's really sort of the key to sort of helping drive, you know, more sort of uh, not only just having people have an emotional awakening and seeing there's like a business sort of case there, but the fact that they actually want to sort of contribute to the narrative about, hey, this is, you know, like you got to, you got to have a voice to be able to make a, to influence a decision to get resources that ultimately drive an action. Right. So that's absolutely. And you got to advocate. I think that's so important. So, so important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like the people in front of it behind the scenes, there are a lot of Asians behind the scenes in Hollywood. They're like writers they are people greenlighting the thing. The our problem is not behind the scenes. It's in front of the camera and representation in front of the camera. Yeah, I heard a very prominent Asian director um, speak, and I won't call him out by name, but he talked about his entire career in Hollywood and, and you know, moving up the ranks and, uh, you know, had never really thought of himself, like you said, as a person of color. And then there was that moment where he got woke and it really changed his entire perspective on thinking about his work, on thinking about who has access and who doesn't. So um, it's, I think it's, it is having these conversations so that um, people think about 
other elements of their identity and what that could mean to communities at large. Mm -hmm. Any other last thoughts? Well, this has been so wonderful having you all. Thank you so much, Serena, Dan, Elliot, and of course, Carmen. This has been a lovely way to kick off the afternoon. Um, we will be uh, sending this recording out for folks who missed it. And we're gonna continue the dialogue in our ongoing um, webinar series, Mirror Moments. Mm -hmm. So look forward to episode three in the next couple of weeks and hope to see you guys soon. Mm -hmm.